Good morning, I'm on site here at Embedded World 2022 and joining me today is Dr. Evan Upton, the CEO and founder of Raspberry Pi. So thank you very much for joining me. Good to be here. Um, so we're going to be talking about the Raspberry Pi and exciting new microcontroller that they've launched. But first of all, could you um, start by explaining the difference between Raspberry Pi for the home and Raspberry Pi for the industry? Well, Raspberry Pi was originally conceived as a platform for getting young people excited about computers again. Yeah. You know, there was enormous excitement, particularly you know, we're UK based, enormous excitement about um, uh, home computing in the 1980s. That fed through into a generation of university students, a generation of professional design engineers. Mm -hmm. um, and as that kind of, as that, some of that excitement ebbed away, universities, industry were struggling to find recruits. Yeah. So that's kind, of, that's kind of where Raspberry Pi has come from, this kind of education and hobbyist space. It's still where a lot of the excitement and energy um, about Raspberry Pi is. Um, what we've seen over the decade that we've been selling Raspberry Pi products is an increase in industrial acceptance, industrial interest, industrial acceptance mm -hmm. of Raspberry Pi products um, as a platform for industrial computing. Mm -hmm. Interesting thing is many, of, and we're seeing this here at the show, many of the, um, uh, those hobbyists who were using Raspberry Pi in 2012, yeah. they were professional design engineers. And a lot of the driver, the, probably the biggest driver for the adoption of Raspberry Pi in industry over that decade has been those hobbyists, those enthusiasts who were also professional engineers, taking the platform with them from their personal lives. And so people come to the stand and say, hey, here's an amazing thing that I've done with Raspberry Pi at home. It runs my media center at home. Yeah. And hey, here's an amazing industrial robot that I've done with the same platform in my, in my day job. Mm, fantastic. Possibilities are endless. <laughs> Um, so what would you say are some of the most beneficial features of the Raspberry Pi? Uh, what we've been able to do is we've been able to take really cutting edge um, silicon, can compute silicon, yeah. we've been able to package it in a form which is very, very generally applicable. We've added a very polished sort layer of, a very polished software environment on top of it. We mm -hmm. provide our own this Raspberry Pi OS, uh, which is an operating system both for, both for um, personal usage you know, Raspberry Pi as a PC. We've always seen ourselves as a PC company. So yeah. Raspberry Pi OS is both the operating system that you'll use if you want to run this thing as a, uh, uh, with a web browser and a word processor as, your, as a general purpose productivity machine, but it's also a very good starting point for people who want to um, uh, build industrial systems mm -hmm. uh, around Raspberry Pi. So you've got kind of cutting edge silicon. It's offered at, very keen, uh, at a very keen cost structure in low volumes. We've always been very, very focused when we set the price of Raspberry Pi. Yeah. We're always very focused on setting the single unit price of Raspberry Pi. And at least nominally, there is no volume discount curve yeah. for Raspberry Pi. The, our, our classic price point is $35. The, the Raspberry Pi Hero product, the one we care about most is, or in any generation, is always tends to be $35. Yeah. Uh, and nominally, one of them costs $35. A thousand of them cost $35,000. <laughs> uh, that's kind of revolutionary, right? The idea yeah. that we're, we're really trying to kind of democratize access to this very high performance computer. Yeah, it's fantastic. So how does the device manage to pack so many features into such a small footprint? Um, I think what, we've, what we're really doing, or at least what we were doing originally, was leveraging um, mobile phone, le leveraging technology that had been de designed for the mobile phone industry. It was often packaged in, well, packaged inside a mobile phone, packaged with a bunch of RF, and kind of taking that, the kind of core compute functionality of a mobile platform, and then presenting it as a single board computer. Yeah. Um, over the years, we've been able to work with our silicon vendors to kind of, to, I guess, to customize the silicon that's delivered into the platform. So we now have a, uh, a silicon platform which is very, very tightly, at the silicon platform level, very, very tightly focused on the requirements of the product. Mm -hmm. And that's let us pack that and Moore's Law effects, economies of scale. You know, we were, we were doing, our products cost $35 when we were making 10,000 of them. Yeah. Now we're making six, seven, eight million of them a year. So kind of those, all of those things stacked together to let us pack, it's roughly 40 times the processing performance of the 2012 Raspberry right, Pi right. In, uh, in Raspberry Pi 4, uh, roughly eight times as much memory, so we've been able to add um, uh, a dual band wireless and Bluetooth. So it's just really, all of those things come together and we've always, you know, we've always, where, I guess, where margin has opened up in the platform, we've tended to pack features into, rather than taking that margin as profit or dropping the price of the platform, what we've always tended to do is take that opportunity to pack more features into our signature price point. Yeah. Excellent, fantastic. So what hardware and software support do you offer? Um, we, uh, so we, we, historically, very little. So historically, we provided the platform, uh, we provided the, uh, the you know, all of the software investments we've made uh, have been at the, uh, at the lowest platform level. So the kind of kernel, kernel and firmware level, some targeted investment in middleware, um, uh, uh, some very, very targeted investment in applications, so media playback and web browsing. Mm -hmm. um, 
So historically, that's been the goal, and it was one of the it's obviously one of the ways we we're able to offer the platform at a uh, at a cost at a yeah. cost effective price point. Probably what you've seen has changed over the last couple of years is the growth of we've we've taken steps to foster a community of design partners around the platform. Right. And so the goal is to make the base platform very very usable for the vast majority of people without design support. Mm -hmm. But where people feel they need design support, we now have a network of partners who we can send people to who will provide that design support on a consulting basis. Excellent. Um, so what would you say are some of the most exciting projects that you've seen come out of the Raspberry Pi? Um, <laughs> there must be loads, I there know. Are, you know, the other thing, there, are, there are loads. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll pick out, I guess I'll treat, I'll pick out one, that, one that's actually ours or yeah. one that's done by the Raspberry Pi Foundation, okay. which is our, our, our charitable parent organisation. Um, Astro Pi, we've put um, uh, two successive pairs of Raspberry Pis. We've had four Raspberry Pis now uh, on the International Space Station. Wow. Um, that um, you know, we, we talk about getting young people excited about yeah. uh, computing, getting young people excited about technology. There is nothing more exciting for a young person than be able to say that your computer program that you've written has run in space. Yeah. And so the Astro Pi program has let tens of thousands of uh, teams of young people run their code on the International Space Station. That's one of ours. Um, other ones, um, we've seen a there are a lot of um, a lot of platforms in the, uh, the probably the digital signage the digital signage space has always been very large yeah. for us. Um, thin client has become big for us as well. Um, you know, we are we have a we have a very long standing relationship with Citrix. Uh, a lot of people now are using Raspberry Pi and Raspberry Pi derived industrial products, commercial products as uh, thin clients on the corporate desktop. Mm -hmm. Um, one of my favorite, kind of whimsical example, um, uh, an engineer, a design engineer in Japan, uh, whose uh, parents ran a cucumber farm, <laughs> was able to build an artificial, an art, a, a, a TensorFlow, train a TensorFlow model to classify Japanese spiny cucumbers into 23 different classes, which is normally done by, done, normally done by human beings, um, and then sort those into instances a aging parents were not enjoying spending all day every day yeah. sorting spiny cucumbers. And so he was able to do not a perfect sort, but a good first pass sort based on machine learning and Raspberry Pi. I like it because it's whimsical. And I like it because it's a, it's a pocket example of what I see a lot of people in the industry doing with Raspberry Pi, which is using it as a kind of hub that interfaces between vision, um, computing, the network, and physical actuation. Yeah. So this is a thing that's taking, uh, this is a thing that's uh, taking pictures, running a local machine learning model, reporting results to the network, and then actuating little paddles to knock these things into buckets. Fantastic. You must be so proud to see your device in so many different applications. It's wonderful and it's disorienting. You know, when you, if you walk around the show here, we were, um, I was walking around the show earlier, and you see how many of the stands here have Raspberry Pi hardware on them, not because they are uh, necessarily uh, marketing a Raspberry Pi device product, but just because people of the sort who are on stands here need general purpose compute. And we are a cost effective and high performance provider. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so, how has the Raspberry Pi changed the way the design community go about prototyping? Um, I think it's given, yeah, because we have this focus on um, we have this focus on single unit cost. Um, it's given people access to a level of capability um, for uh, at a price point and at an availability level. Now, obviously, we're currently in a we're currently in an interesting and challenging environment oh. with respect to the availability of any electronic product. Um, but in general, yeah, the, the the pitch of Raspberry Pi is you can go buy 10,000 Raspberry Pis tomorrow. Um, you go buy, buy them today and they'll turn up tomorrow. Yeah. Um, that's transformative because it gives people confidence to prototype and confidence that they, can, they will be able to go to their first level of prototype production um, without any supply chain challenges. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, been, that's been transformative. The challenge for us is always to find ways to keep people with us, to keep people in our ecosystem, to yeah. keep people with our platform um, as they scale. Um, compute module. Um, the, our, our compute module line of products is really key to that. So taking the brain, so you might see someone who does their first thousand um, uh, units on the back of the Raspberry Pi single board computer platform, mm -hmm. then as they just want, want to go to scale, maybe they want to take some cost out of the platform, maybe they want to get some flexibility in terms of form factor, they'll then you migrate to our modularized um, uh, version of the platform, right. which then gives them flexibility to design a baseboard which has the, the, the physical form factor and the mix of peripherals that they really need for their scale product. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. So, Embedded World just happens to be the place where you launched Raspberry Pi 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. How has the device evolved over the last 10 years? Yeah, so this is the spiritual home of Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's to blame for, so we launched Raspberry Pi on the 29th of February 2012. <laughs> um, so it's like, it is to blame for this idiosyncratic birthday we have. So we've only had two <laughs> birthday parties so far. Right? We'll, oh have another, we'll, have a great, we'll have a great birthday party in two years' time for our, for our third birthday. Um, uh, it's, I mean, obviously, the, the main, yeah, as a device, um, it's 
gained a, um, I'll just probably pick out three things. One, the device itself. We've iteratively optimized the, the design around both. Fortunately, there hasn't really been a tension between the things we've wanted to do to make it better for education and the things yeah. we've done to make it better for industry. So just the quality of the device has improved. The, um, uh, the, the performance of the device has improved massively. You yeah. have roughly, as I said, a, roughly a 40-fold uh, increase in performance um, between our, our starting point and where we are today. Um, so those are big things. I think, the, I think probably the other things are, are more ecosystem uh, more ecosystem items. So just a vast number of companies um, innovating around Raspberry Pi, offering um, uh, value-added solutions built on the Raspberry Pi platform. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, you know, this would be a, it's a platform for open innovation, right? This isn't, um, this would be a very different world if every innovation in the Raspberry Pi ecosystem had to come from us. We're still a relatively small organization. Yeah. The most exciting things about Raspberry Pi are the things that we don't know about until someone walks up to our stand here and tells us about them. <laughs> well, following on from that then, where, where do you see the Raspberry Pi heading in the future? You know, what do you predict people will need from it in you know, the next five, 10 years? Um, I think there's a, the, the interesting thing is because that Raspberry Pi 3, in, in 20, when we launched Raspberry Pi 3 in 2016, so quite a yeah. long way back three, you know, actually uh, only four years into the program, um, that was the point at which the Raspberry Pi kind of reached maturity in terms of the basic offer from the platform. That's the point at which we added wireless networking, uh, where we added Wi-Fi and uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Um, and really, subsequent Raspberry Pi platforms have been quantitative, quantitative rather than qualitative um, uh, uh, improvements. And so yes, absolutely, you can imagine that future Raspberry Pi platforms. It's a little bit hard to think about this in the middle of all the supply chain challenges that the industry is facing. But obviously, future Raspberry Pis are likely to be more powerful. Yeah. They're likely to grow support for new radio standards. Um, uh, you know, new, new radio standards, new interfacing standards. Um, generally, um, all of those things are higher performance versions of standards that we already support. So you can imagine some sort of evolution there. Um, we obviously have had some form factor innovation um, in the Raspberry Pi 4 gen previous generations. We've made the single board computer product and a modularized version. With Raspberry Pi 4, we did the the, the, the basic SBC, we did the modules, and we've also done this product called Pi 400, mm -hmm. which is really harking back to that 1980s, a Raspberry Pi computer, a Raspberry Pi PC and a keyboard, really <laughs> harking back to that 1980s form factor. Yeah. Well, you may see some more form factor innovation from us. We do work with our, um, uh, we do work with our partners to, to try to understand what form factors people are asking for. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether there is another form factor variation in the SBC space or in the module space. Um, so yeah, you'll, I think you'll, you'll, see, you'll see certainly quantitative innovation. And then you'll see us trying to build out, you know, we talk a little bit about um, missing compliments. Uh, you know, we, were, we were originally very purist with Raspberry Pi. We said, we're just going to build the, we're just going to build the board. Yeah. And then over time, we got drawn into building certain targeted accessories that really exploit engineering capabilities we have. Yeah. So cameras and displays where, where the kind of knowledge of the GPU functionality and the design is very useful. Um, then you've seen us do um, what we call generic accessories, things like USB power supplies. Yeah. We're largely, uh, you know, we're taking a, a third-party design, applying our level of kind of design gloss to it, and then making it available to people. So you'll see, you'll probably see, there are a few more generics that we don't have, and you might see us do some generics. Uh, and all of those things, as you build, you know, what have we learned from a business perspective? It's not just about the core product. It's about the complements around it, whether those are physical objects, whether those are software objects, or whether they are ecosystem objects. Uh, and the Approved Design Partner Program is probably the biggest example of that. Yeah, wow, I look forward to seeing where you go in the future. Um, as I say, it's still fun. I mean, I've been running yeah. this for a decade. It's still fun, and it's still fun because we are finding things today. You know, we will come away from the show, I'm sure, with two or three things that we really should have known about. Yeah. Two, two or three things that we really should be doing. Uh, and that's what keeps it fresh. Brilliant, that's fantastic. So can you tell us now about your microcontroller mm. that you launched in January last year? So mm. what are some of its features and use cases? Well, this is, so the, I knew this is really what we're here to talk about. This is really what we're here, here at the show to, yeah. to talk about and promote. Um, Raspberry Pi historically has been a, uh, an electronic product manufacturer. We take other people's silicon, we assemble it into what we think are very innovative products. Yeah. But nonetheless, we are taking other people's silicon in order to do that. Um, RP2040 and so Raspberry Pi Pico, which mm -hmm. is our board level microcontroller product, and RP2040, which is the microcontroller that power it, represent a kind of a departure from that mode of that, that, from that mode of operation, mm. right? where we're saying, well, actually, what have we, in the decade we've been doing this, what have we learned? 
about what makes a good piece of silicon for one of our products and is that now within as with a larger engineering team is it now within our reach to try and build a perfect what we would consider to be a perfect microcontroller yeah. and that's what rp2040 is it's really raspberry pi's attempt to build a perfect microcontroller mm -hmm. and i guess there were two things going on there one is we've brought a you know a good a very polished generic microcontroller platform to a fairly advanced process node to the 40 nanometer process node many many microcontrollers are on one of the reasons why there are availability challenges in particular for microcontrollers is that they are often built on very old process nodes yeah. which have very fixed, finite amounts of capacity uh, and where uh, the logic density is low enough that individual die are quite large mm -hmm. and therefore you're not getting a lot of value out of each wafer. We brought our controller to 40, uh, to, to, to 40 nanometers, which you get if we have a 300mm um, wafer, we get 21,000 die out of that wafer. Um, so, you, so you get a device which is both very efficient in its use of silicon, very relevant this year, yeah. um, has very low power consumption, very low dynamic power consumption because, you know, because, because it's on the advanced process node. So we've taken a, a strong, well-designed generic microcontroller to an advanced process node. Um, and then we have uh, what I'd call a spike in the design. We have this thing called uh, programmable I.O., P.I.O. in the design. Mm -hmm. And that's really designed. We have, we have a the standard set of um, medium speed um, uh, digital serial interfaces, ITC, SPI, and UART. Yeah. But then we have this um, system, uh, this PIO system, uh, with um, eight state machines, which you can use to implement almost anything else. You can use it to implement almost any other. Uh, you, know, you can use it to implement more of what we have. So I had somebody come to the stand this morning and look at the brochure and say, ah, you only have two UARTs, I need five UARTs. And I'm like, well, actually, the PIO will give you another four UARTs. Yeah. Uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's enough for you. Um, so it lets you it lets you build these uh, more more of the um, interfaces we have. It lets you build novel interfaces. We've seen people. It wasn't designed for it, but we've seen people use this to implement SDIO, to implement uh, DPI, to implement DVI. Mm. We have people actually driving DVI video out of our little microcontroller. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of an, and that that gives it a where probably the story this year about RP2040 is about quality and about availability and about efficiency in its use of silicon. What we believe over the kind of five to 10 year time frame is the ability to use, as people become more familiar with the PIO subsystem, the ability to use it in roles where, you know, historically maybe you would have ended up putting the CP, uh, CPL, small FPGAs, CPLDs, um, uh, fixed function logic into your design. Perhaps you can do some of those things with mm. RP2040. I can tell you're very excited about it. <laughs> I am really excited about it. I mean, I, you know, it's, I, I, you know, I love chip. You know, chips are, you know, we're in a we're in a hall full of people who uh, who make chips. Indeed, yeah. Uh, and it's it's. I, I love I love making chips because it's high stakes gambling, right? You know, you do a lot of you do a lot of uh, you do a lot of work, and then one day you press a button and you do a tape out and you spend a million dollars, and then you wait 13 weeks, okay. and you get back a chip and it works or it doesn't. Right? And and the feeling when a you know we've done we've been doing this myself a long time, and obviously many of my colleagues have been doing it for a lot, a lot longer than I do. Um, and the, the feeling when one of these comes back and works, the feeling when RP2040 came back and worked and worked well um, was, is, is wonderful. And the lovely thing about microcontrollers compared to some of the larger chips I've worked on in, in, my, in, in the past of my career is they are small enough that they can be perfect. Yeah. You know, big chips are far too complicated to ever be perfect. At some level there will always be something wrong, which is mitigated, but where you know in your heart when you're looking at it, oh, I could have done that better. The microcontroller in RP2040 is so very, very close to being yeah. perfect that it's been a very satisfying thing to be involved in. Mm. Well, I'm very excited as well. So, yeah, it's great. Yeah, thank uh, you very much. Yeah. And of course, we are, I should say, and of course, we are giving away um, Picos to everybody at the show. Oh. Um, so, so if you're at the show, you should have been offered one at the door. Yeah. Uh, if you weren't offered the one at the door, if you were to walk past our stand uh, here in, in, in uh, um, uh, Hall 4A, yep. um, then uh, you will probably have one pressed into your hand by one of our uh, by one of our people. Fantastic. I'll make sure I walk that way. Please do. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you. You too. Thank you.